Everyone loves those science projects we completed back in grade school, like making a potato battery or even the classic erupting volcano. But while it is elementary students doing these projects, the science behind them is actually pretty interesting. So let's take a look at how the most popular science projects actually work. We'll start off with the potato battery. You can actually make a battery with lemons, oranges, or other fruits, but there's nothing as quintessential as a potato battery. The potato battery is classified as an electrochemical cell, which converts chemical energy into electrical energy through electron transfer. As you likely know, potato batteries and other fruit batteries require a piece of copper and a piece of zinc. The copper acting as a cathode and the zinc acting as an anode. By sticking the copper and zinc inside of the potato, but apart from one another, you facilitate what's called a redox reaction, a reduction oxidation reaction between the zinc and copper. The electricity doesn't actually come from the potato, rather the water and electrolytes in the spud allow electrons from the copper to move to the zinc, creating a small electrical current. In this reaction, the copper is being reduced, thus the shed of electrons, and the zinc is being oxidized. The way a potato battery battery works is, on premise, the same way all electrochemical batteries that you have store and release energy. So what about the famous erupting volcano? A baking soda and vinegar volcano is the essence of a grade school science fair, so how does it work? Apart from the fact that the volcano project is actually nothing like an actual volcano, the experiment is actually a good one to teach about the fundamentals of chemistry. Vinegar and baking soda are usually used in the reaction, although hot water can be substituted for the vinegar. Baking soda has a chemical name of sodium bicarbonate, and vinegar is acetic acid. When the two chemicals are combined, they produce an acid-base reaction with the byproduct of CO2 or carbon dioxide. For those of you interested in the actual chemical reaction taking place, this is what it looks like. The outcome of the acid-base reaction is sodium acetate, water, and gaseous carbon dioxide, which is what makes the bubbles and foam. Many projects even use dish soap to increase the surface tension of the bubbles to create an even bigger eruption, all in the name of science, of course. So finally, let's talk about something known as dancing liquid. Non-Newtonian fluids are incredibly fun to play with no matter how old you are. The ability for something to exist in a solid state under high stress and exist as a liquid under low stress is pretty weird and intriguing even when we know what's going on. The most common non-Newtonian fluid is something called oobleck which is made from cornstarch and water. When the cornstarch is mixed with the water, it becomes a goopy, slimy mess with some interesting properties. When you hit or even run across the fluid, the molecules of the cornstarch rigidly align and present low strain. When the stress is implied over a longer period of time, the fluid responds exactly like any other fluid would. Taking these principles even further, placing a non-Newtonian fluid on a speaker produces what is known as dancing liquid, the original experiment. The vibrations in the speaker apply a stress at a high enough rate to engage the rigidity of the cornstarch molecules, and just as they start to convert back to a fluid phase, the speaker creates another vibration. This period of actions and reactions create, well, what looks like a dancing liquid. So that's how the most popular and sometimes simple looking science experiments work. It involves a lot of simple chemistry that's core to cooking and making batteries and many other things that are relevant to the world today. And that's what makes these so popular. They spark a little bit of curiosity and get people interested in the science of how the world works.